Everyone struggles. The difference is what you do when you struggle. What will you do and how will you respond when you struggle? The story goes as a woman who was having a lot of financial troubles. Her business was going bust and the serious condition of it, she was so desperate she decided to ask God for help. She began to pray and she said, God, please help me. I've lost my business. If I don't get some money, I'm going to lose my house as well. Please, God, let me win the lottery. The lottery comes out that night and somebody else wins it. The woman, the woman again prays and says, God, please let me win the lottery. I've lost my business. I've lost my house. I'm going to lose my car as well. The lottery that night comes on and still someone else wins. No luck for the lady. Once again, she prays, oh, God, why have you forsaken me? I've lost my business, my house, and my car. My children are starving. I don't often ask for help. And I have always been a good servant to you. So please, God, she begged, please, just let me win the lottery this one time so I can get my life back in order. Suddenly, there was a blinding flash of light from the heavens. And they opened up and they beamed down on the woman. And a sort of confrontational voice said this. It was God himself. And he said, for crying out loud, buy a ticket. At some point, God is going to expect you to buy a ticket. At some point, God is going to expect you to do something, to actually put a little feet to your faith, is what we like to say. One of my favorite things to do, it's not one of my favorite shows, but one of my favorite things to do is to watch the TV show, The Biggest Loser, you know, the one where they lose all the way, is to watch the show, The Biggest Loser, while eating ice cream. It's just so rewarding. There's something about watching these people lose weight. It's inspiring. But it's just exhausting watching some of them run and work out. And, and the thing is, I've been a little stagnant this winter. And so I've gained more weight. I'm the heaviest I've ever been in my life. And so now the bowl head, when I sit, has a little shelf to rest on. There you go. That's why God makes that. So you can just put it... And there's nothing better than watching The Biggest Loser while watching ice cream and maybe put a little chocolate syrup on it too because that really makes it better. Uh, but the point is that I can't ask God to help me get in shape if I do nothing. God help me lose weight as I stuff my face full of ice cream. But isn't that how most of our plans work with God? We just ask Him to do something and we never involve ourselves. We never buy a ticket. We never get on a treadmill. We never cut back our diet. We never like, readjust our finances. And then we wonder why we're so poor and why we're so stretched all the time. And yet we've done things with our money God would never allow us to do if we actually sat down and asked Him. We've asked God to heal us from habits and stuff. All along while we keep buying the habit. Yeah. Let's see, some of you are like, I'm glad this is His last Sunday. <laughs> um, this is the difference between hope and faith. The difference between hope and faith, if you're taking notes, let me give you a few things about the difference between hope and faith. Faith is action. Hope is waiting. With faith, you put your feet to your faith. You act on your faith. Hope, you wait. You wait to see. Um, young people, you're not married. You're here and you're a young lady. You hope you get a great guy. But faith says this, be involved in God's will, be involved in God's plan, be faithful to God, and faith will put me in the right place where God will introduce me to that man. Hope is waiting, but faith is putting yourself, and now, on that same thing, it wouldn't hurt to put a little makeup on either, but you know, uh, I remember the old Southern Baptist preacher said, you know, every, even an old bar needs a fresh coat of paint, so you know. Um, what are you going to do? Okay. What are you going to do to me? I'm bulletproof. But anyway, uh, secondly, faith is now, hope is future. Faith is about the now and how you're living your life, how you, what decision you're going to make now, uh, how you're going to treat someone now. But by, by the way, being kind to people who are not kind back to you is purely faith. It's faith that God said something, you're going to respond and you're going to do it. Hope is all about the future. 
when you're a little kid, you know, you, you hope for Christmas. You hope, you know, no one really checks the list and doesn't do it, you know, and you walk down there and there's stuff. It's like, I knew he couldn't see me, but you know, that's the difference. Now let me give you a couple of verses to kind of emphasize the difference, all right? It's this. Faith is an intellectual decision based on past events or a trusted authority. Faith is, listen, if somebody tells you, well, faith means you check your mind at the door. No, it is not. Listen, I'm not an, athe an atheist because I did not have that much faith to be an atheist. I believe in a creator because it just makes more sense and the science backs up that there is a creator. How and when we can argue and all this other stuff, but that tells me that there's a creator. Faith is intellectual. There's an intellectual basis for faith. Here's the verse. Don't believe me? Hebrews 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the what? Evidence. Evidence is intellectual. It's facts. You can point to it. It's science. The things not seen. But hope, hope is waiting for something that has never happened before. Faith is this. Listen, you can trust God because you've seen God be faithful in your life before. You've seen God do certain things. But hope is that I hope in something that I have never even seen or possibly thought of. Example, what do we hope for? Well, the coming of Christ. I've never seen that. I have faith that God can save you from your sin. Because I've seen God do that before. I have faith that God can heal you from an addiction. I have faith that God can bring a marriage back together. Because I have seen that before. I have never seen Jesus come through the clouds. So the first, I kind of back it up. Looking for that blessed what? This is the return of Christ. Hope and glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. I have faith because I've seen God do it. I have hope because I'm trusting that something I have never seen before will happen. Real life example, all right? You can have faith, or excuse me, you can have hope that the Cubs win the World Series. But faith tells you they won't. You understand? Hope is something I've never seen this in my life. Right there? You can correct me next week. Hope is something I've never seen. But faith, look, I, if you're a Bears fan, you don't have to have hope that the Bears can win the Super Bowl unless you're under 40. Right? If you're over 40 or over 35, you can have faith. Why? Because you've seen it before in your lifetime. Hope is something you've never seen. Faith is based on something that you already know. And here's the thing about hope. Our one sort of power thought is this. Hope can be powerful and dangerous. When you misuse it, hope can be dangerous. Well, I have hope that God's going to do... Wait a second. That goes against God's will. How do you know God's will? God's word says the opposite. And so when you jump into something that isn't God's will or with God's word, it can be fair. I'm hoping that God will do this. That's not what God's ever said. And you're kind of conflicting here, and you're hoping on to something that could possibly never happen. Hope that God will do something great is amazing. But if you've never seen it before, it can be dangerous. Faith is, I've seen God. Or God said this is what He wants to happen. Look, if you have hope that someone you love will accept Christ, that is good. But you really should start to have faith. You say, well, I've never seen that person accept Christ. Okay. But what does the Word of God say? It is God's will that all men be saved. So I can start to put faith. And it's a subtle difference. And we're going to see that today in Luke chapter 7 as we meet a lady who has nothing but hope. Her only son and child. She has no daughter, but it's her only son has died. As sort of an adult, it seems like he's probably a teenager or something. She's a widow. She is all alone. It is a life of destitute and poverty that waits her. At her age, she's probably not going to get remarried. She's not going to be able to have a child because she's hit that age where it's not going to happen anymore. But Jesus will bring her hope. Now, last week, we saw faith, right? That Roman centurion sent people to Jesus 
to heal his one of his servants. All right? He did that all by faith. In fact, look up a few verses in that. Remember what it says? It was by faith. It was by faith. Okay? Why? Because he had already trusted in God. He was an Old Testament Gentile believer. He had already put his faith in God. He had already put his faith and determined what he had seen and heard of Jesus. He was the Messiah to come. He didn't know about the cross. He didn't know about all the resurrection probably. He didn't understand it all completely. But he had faith. Abraham was the same way. Abraham was not saved by works. Abraham was saved by faith. He is the father of all people who have faith. Okay? That man had faith. Faith. And what did he do? He put his feet to his faith and he sent people to Jesus. And his faith was even shown more because he sends more people and say, don't even bother coming to my house, Jesus. I'm so unworthy. Just say the word. There are two towns over. Say the word and I know. That is faith. This lady has hope. She has not sent for Jesus. There's a funeral procession. And we sort of had them, uh, it was kind of neat, uh, Chuck passed away, we had his funeral, and they went the long way for his funeral procession because they wanted to take him by his farm. And so that was kind of cool. I thought my mom has said that when she dies that she wants the funeral procession and she wants them to pop open the, the coffin as they drive by and she wants them to go by her house. My mom loves her house and everything. And so that's what she said. This is sort of this big funeral procession they're going to be coming through. Jesus was not invited he was not asked to come. This is the difference between faith and hope. Now, look at verse 11. And it came to pass that the day after that he went to a city. This is the day after he healed that servant. Into the city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him. And much people. People are starting to follow him. He's healing people, casting out demons. A lot happens in this chapter. Uh, now, there was coming nigh to the gate of the city. It's a big funeral procession. They're showing their respect, Middle Eastern culture, weeping and wailing. At my funeral, somebody cried. In fact, I was I hear people like, like Chuck said about this, he wanted people to rejoice. I don't want any rejoicing, I want weeping and wailing. In fact, I want to, I'm going to pay people to come in and cut. And this is what I really want to do. I, I, this sounds so bad, but what are you going to do? I'm leaving. Um, I want to find like some young girl and pay her, like when I'm old, if I know I'm dying, and say, look, I want you to dress like you're like a lady of the night and come in and just jump on the cast and go, oh, I loved him so much! I think that would be hilarious. Be like, what in the world? <laughs> it would be awesome to happen. And, and my wife would be like, he, he's good, he's dead. That's for sure. Um, but anyways, they're weeping and wailing and everything and, you know, making a big commotion. I talked to the funeral director. He said certain cultures, like uh, the, the Italian culture, that when, especially the ones first come over at the funeral home, people will go up and they'll kneel and they will wail. And then the next person will go up and it's like a contest to wail more. It's like some of these people don't even know the dead. But it's just sort of a custom from uh, a lot of the uh, European. This is a lot like this. It's a big procession. People are crying. They're coming to the gate, and they're going to go out and bury this young man. Now I came nigh to the gate. Behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and much people of the city was worth her, with her. Maybe this lady is you. You're really not sure about the whole God thing. This lady did not believe Jesus was the Messiah at this point. She, if she did, she would have invited Jesus. She would say, come, be here. I know you're the I know what you can do. Maybe that's you. You're just sort of with, you're at hope. I hope he exists. And by the way, isn't that how most religions operate? Notice this. Most religions don't operate on faith. They just operate on hope. And you'll hear this by atheists that, oh, fairy tales. You know, it's just some sort of, or they're, they're just made up stories to teach us lessons. And you know what that is? That's hope. Maybe you're just here and you're just, I just have a little, maybe you're a young person. I just have hope that God really exists. Can I just sort of maybe ask you, maybe, maybe this next week, just sort of ask God to begin to reveal himself to you. Ask God, and this is how God kind of works. There's sort of a hope you know, understand. Remember before you had God saved, accepted Christ, you sort of were, oh, he might be God, maybe he's not. I mean, it's, something is out there, I'm not exactly sure. And stuff. But after you came to know Christ, it became solidified. You had, now you had faith. You're not going to heaven because you have hope there's a God. You're going to heaven specifically because you have faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross. Isn't that a difference? Um, anyways. A little side note. Uh, these people here, just, just to help you, just to help you. 
What these people are doing is what you're supposed to do at a funeral. Um, I just, just to help you, this is not my message. When you go to a funeral, don't talk about the people who died in your life. Don't talk about anything about you. You go to a funeral and you ask questions about the person they love. Amen? This is what these people are doing. They're not coming in and then go, oh, well, let me tell you about when my father passed away. No, because they're grieving. They don't, the people I remember when my dad passed away are the people who said nothing. The worst people were like, well, let me tell you my story of grief. I'm like, I don't really care about your story of grief. The lady who made the biggest impression on me was uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Teppenhart. And her, I, I loved her. And she was an older lady and stuff. And her uh, husband had passed away and we kind of talked about it. And she came to the funeral home when my dad had died in the funeral home. And she said nothing to me. She hugged me, held my hand, and sat by me. And then she hugged me and got up and walked away. That's what you do at a funeral. And by the way, if you want friends, that's what you do for friends. Stop talking about yourself. Talk about other people. I know it's hard if you're awesome like me. Right, back to here, verse 13. This is how God sees you, even if you're not a believer. Look at verse 13. This is great. Even if you're here, if you don't believe in Jesus, he believes in you. Watch. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. Do you understand that verse 13 tells me that the struggles I have in my life and the things that break my heart break God's heart too? He said, well, that can't be that big of a deal. And that's, you know, it's so small and petty. If it breaks your heart, it breaks God's heart. And that's what salvation is. It's not knowing God as some religious, mystical being or some religious rites or anything. It's having an intimate, personal God through Jesus Christ. And Christian, so I'm saved. I got my ticket to heaven. I've done my heart. God wants to be closer to you. He wants to be more than an escape hatch on eternity. He wants to be close because what breaks your heart breaks the heart of God. Now, this lady does not have faith. If she had faith, Jesus would be there. But she doesn't turn Jesus away. She could have stopped him what he's about to do. But she goes... Well, it's, it's worth a chance. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've never seen God do anything in your life. Maybe you're not a believer. Maybe it's time to just go, it's worth a chance. It's worth a shot. Verse 14. When we get out of Jesus' way, this happens. And when he came and touched the briar, that's the coffin, and they that bear him stood still, and he says this, Think of Lazarus and think of a few other examples. Young man, I say unto thee, arise. Now look, I love movies and everything. And I hate how Jesus is portrayed in just about every movie but the passion. Jesus was a man. He was strong. He was confident. He was powerful. He did not talk and look like the to go and have long hair. And then his, I mean, he, might, he had Jewish hair and all that other stuff. And, and he was a carpenter and he worked with his hands and he was masculine. And I think when he says this, I want you to picture this. It gets tense. If this was a movie, you know, they would you know, zoom in on Jesus' eyes and the widow's eyes and everything. And they show his hand getting closer. And he puts it on there. And they, they do a close-up shot. And he says, young man. And then they show the, the coffin. And they come back to him. And he says, I say unto thee. And then there would be a pause probably. And he does this in his deep voice. Arise. And there's drips of swat, swat, sweat coming off one of the guys holding the coffin. They pan over to the mother. She's just red eyes and tears and crying. And Jesus just has this confident look on him and everything. And here's, you see, this is the problem why you don't get into the Bible. Because you don't read it like that. You just read it. Da, 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 da. No, read it like it's real. Read it. See some of the emotion that take place in it. These are real people with real hearts. And this is a real woman. Her heart is breaking. And here's the result, verse 15. And he that was dead sat up. There was hope for the Presbyterian. <laughs> and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. Now, now she has faith. See, before this, she never saw Jesus do anything. She didn't even really know who she was. She never heard. Faith comes by hearing, hearing about Jesus, Romans 10 tells us. She had absolutely no faith. But now, she knew who God was. She saw Jesus move. 
Okay. Listen, if you're here today and you say, well, I just don't know if I have enough faith. I don't you. If you had enough faith to accept Christ as your Savior <laughs> and to trust that what Jesus yeah. said about himself was true, and, uh, that he was the only way, that he was the gate, no man cometh unto the Father but through him. And whether you asked Jesus into your heart or accepted Christ or decided to be, accept his path, I mean, you can use terminology. I got saved. That's what I did then. I got born again and I accepted Jesus when I accepted Christ. I heard terminology when I